Hi everybody, welcome to a revision session which is going to be looking very specifically at how to score really high marks on the, the Edexcel supported or structured multiple choice paper. Uh, okay, so this is the idea of looking at the eight question paper, there are eight multiple choice questions. Some students uh, leave these till the end, I think the vast majority uh, get straight in. And my advice is to tackle the multiple choice first, it gets you into the rhythm of the paper. Oftentimes it reminds you of, of uh, key diagrams that could be useful uh, later on in the daily response paper. Really important, I think, everybody, that you don't spend too long on these questions. Uh, eight questions, uh, 32 marks on offer. Uh, my strong advice is not to spend anything more than 35 minutes on this section. In fact, I would write down eight fours, four, eight, 12, 16, 20, 24, 28, 32, and I would be absolutely strict with myself on timing as I'm going through these questions. Make sure you're spending four minutes on each. If you've got the right technique, if obviously if you know your stuff, first of all, but if you've got the right technique, you'll get, uh, you'll get the answers down well and quickly, nail the marks, and the message from this session is so once you've got the marks, move on, move on, don't loiter, crack on with the paper. Now, here's, here's what I think is uh, a key point in this little short revision presentation. Each question, there are going to be eight, each question will test one key economic idea or theory. This is crucial because if you can recognize what the, what the idea is, what the concept is that they're testing, that will certainly help you focus your answer and produce an, ac an accurate and neat and ultimately a successful paper. What are the key points? First of all, being a calculator, you may need to do some calculations, uh, certainly, for example, in the daily response paper, but you might, you might do it in the multiple choice. Bring a pencil, bring a ruler, but crucially, uh, bring your A game to this paper. There is one mark, as you know, for identifying the correct answer. And uh, typically, most students actually you know, get the answers right, which is reassuring. And of course, there are up to three marks for supporting evidence on the back of the answer that you've given. So uh, various ways to get the three marks and then to get the four. You can get up to two marks for a full accurate definition. And my advice actually is always to give a correct key definition if it's in the um, question. So um, always give a definition for a term given in the question or in the correct response. Okay, no marks for defining terms that are in the incorrect response, but if, you, if there is a definition there, either in the question or in the correct response, nail a mark with a definition. And that, of course, only leaves two marks left. And for that, you can explain the theory, you can link it, to the question, you could you could apply the theory with an example, uh, or you can use diagrams and annotation. But we'll have a look at those in a second. Now, the idea of the knockout mark, the so-called rejection mark approach. It is true that you can get up to three marks for rejecting answers that are wrong. Uh, that is true, undeniably so. My very strong advice to you and uh, this is the advice I give my own students, is not to rely on rejection or knockout marks. My focus will be on getting the answer right and explaining why it's right, rather than spending a lot of time often trying to explain why it's wrong. The, the knockout mark typically is for students who aren't necessarily going to get the higher grades. Um, key advice taken from the examiner's report in 2014, very important you, you remember understand that to get a knockout mark, you, get, you can't just say that the, uh, that's the opposite of an incorrect key is true. Okay, you can't just say that, many students do. You, you've got to actually do something different to get a knockout mark. Um, in, in the paper, uh, there's probably gonna be at least three, well, possibly two, but maybe three opportunities where a diagram is provided and you're looking to annotate. When I collect my scripts in from students and mark them, if there's a diagram there which hasn't been annotated, I want to know why. There's up to two marks for a good annotation of a diagram. 
If there's no diagram provided and you think it's relevant to the question, then draw your own diagram. And again, up to two marks for doing that. This is obviously a paper where you don't have to evaluate at all. Some students do <laughs> for some reason. Um, but be prepared you know, to, to, to work out some calculations, to use the data. Uh, if there might be a table that needs to be completed. Um, whenever you get some calculations or a formula or a table to complete, show me you're working. Be credited with that um, as you go through the paper. So there's, all, there's many, many different ways to get four marks on this paper. The most important point is not to waste time. Life's too short. So one mark for a correct response, one or possibly two marks for defining a, a turn in the question or the correct response, two marks for linking the theory to the question, providing a diagram, annotation. Once you think you've got your marks, move on everybody, nothing more to watch, nothing more to see, move on. You need to leave plenty of time uh, to read through the two data response questions before deciding which one to attempt. If you spend too long on multiple choice, it's likely that you're going to miss out on one, possibly two, of the 14 marked data response questions. And that, crucially, is where a lot of marks can be left. So four minutes per question, be strict on yourself. What I thought I'd do in this short session is just, just take you through two or three examples from uh, recent past papers, maybe papers you haven't seen before, and just have a look at uh, how to get the marks. And hopefully this will be useful for you. So here's a question uh, with a diagram provided. And uh, instinctively in the exam, thinking, right, what's the concept? What's the idea that's being tested here? Well, it's the production possibility frontier, something I know you, you probably love, this topic. Uh, what's happened here? Well, the original P, uh, PPF was WU, and it shifted out to WZ. They've given a little bit of data there. So prior to the shift out, the PPF was a straight line with a one-to-one -one opportunity cost. Now we can produce 150 units of textiles and 100 units of wheat. So effectively now for each unit of wheat we produce, we're giving up more textiles than we did before. So the question is, which of the following does this chain show? So it can't be A, can't be increased demand for textiles, can't be a decrease in the production of wheat when that's not shown. The answer is C. It has to be C that the, the uh, one of the causes of a shift in the PPF is if we increase the efficiency uh, with which we produce goods and services. So how do you get the, how do you get the marks here? So the answer is C, how do you get the marks? First of all, you can define a PPF and define it in terms of combinations of wheat and textiles using all available resources efficiently. Therefore, if there's a rise in improvement in efficiency, we see an outward shift of the PPF. And you just nail the extra mark by explaining how that can happen. Maybe benefiting from division of labor, or maybe um, getting a, a benefit from a technological improvement or an innovation in the production of, of textiles. That makes it possible to produce a higher level of, out, of textiles without lost output of wheat. And I've annotated a diagram here. As you can see, I've drawn a, a halfway point on each of the PPFs and shown that with a we produce 50 units of wheat, we can now increase our output of textiles from 50 to 75, okay, because of the efficiency gain. Uh, D is, is wrong because the opportunity cost of wheat has actually gone up, not down. And uh, I've kind of shown that in my answer. Now that's more than you need to get four marks. A definition, an annotation, an explanation of the outward shift, you know, the marks are yours, and hopefully you've moved on by this point. And so will I. Here's another question, this time in the form of a table. And again, in the exam, thinking, right, what's the concept here? What's the really important idea? Because each question only tests one idea. In this case, it's income elasticity of demand. And we're given information on two countries, Cyprus and the Maldives, two favorite holiday locations. This is income elasticity. And... Um, what we find is that uh, the demand for cereals is unresponsive to the to the level of, of income here. Okay, so let's have a look here. Answer is 
B. We find, let's knock out A for a start. The demand for tobacco is incoelastic in both countries. No, incoelastic means that the incoelasticity is less than one. So you get to the answer by defining income elasticity of demand. You can give a formula. Uh, the YAD for meat in Cyprus is 0.5, and then the model gives it's 0.8. So for both, that's income inelastic. We tend to buy a little bit more meat when income rises, but not a lot, lot more. Okay. In the Maldives, the income elasticity of tobacco uh, is 1.0. Now that that's, that is not income inelastic. Okay. Whereas obviously for Cyprus it is. If you find the term, recognize this is an inelast income inelastic demand. And a good way of nailing the extra market. So we'll give an example. If income was to rise by 20% in both countries. Then the demand for meat would only rise by 10% um, in Cyprus or 16% uh, in the Maldives, or you could take a 10% change in income that would cause a 5% uh, increase in demand in Cyprus and only an 8% increase in demand in the Maldives. Recognizing here that this is about income elasticity and it's a, something very specific, it's when the income elasticity demand is less than one. And finally, here's a slightly harder question. We're given a, a theory diagram. Um, the, this is the market for microchips. I'm told the initial equilibrium is at, is at P, price PE, quantity QE at the intersection X. You may annotate the diagram in your answer. Actually, I read that as you must annotate the diagram. This is the, this is the skill we like to see students do. I read the question through carefully. A decrease in production costs through the development of new technology is most likely to do what? Well, think it through. The cost of production go down. The supply curve for microchips will shift to the right. There'll be an outward shift of supply. That's gonna drive the price down in the market and it's gonna, it's gonna affect consumer and producer surplus. Well, let's have a look at, if you annotate the diagram, let's just put it in here. So you would annotate by showing an outward shift of supply to S2, price falls to P2, and the quantity goes to Q2. Right, you should be able to see that the consumers will benefit from this because uh, they get a lower price for the microchips and the quantity is, is higher. So the answer is D. The technological improvement will lower the market price and increase the consumer surplus. How do we get our marks? Well, we define a key term in the correct answer, which is D, define consumer surplus. The difference between what consumers are willing and able to pay for something and, and the price they actually do pay. Um, you can get marks for saying the fall in production costs will cause an outward shift of supply. And show that on the diagram. Annotate, draw to the axes, show the new price and quantity and show the new level of consumer surplus. Simple answer, the new level of consumer surplus is area Z, P2, S. Now, in the exam, lots of students shade the new levels of consumer surplus. My strong advice to you in the exam is to label areas, label areas rather than shade. Shading is particularly messy and doesn't look good. The labeling areas in the diagram is much the much the best way to uh, to give a good impression in the exam. So please, please do that. So you see how the marks we could get here, the definition, explanation of the shift, uh, showing an area. Uh, there's more than enough to get four here. If you can annotate quickly and, and accurately, you'll be in a good, good shape. A couple of bits of advice uh, from the examiners from last year. Um, the first bit of advice I think is particularly good. Um, students should always annotate the diagram that's been given to them instead of spending time drawing the same diagram out again. So if you're given a diagram, annotate what you've got. Of course, you might make a mistake in the exam. You might have to correct that and uh, maybe draw a second diagram. Do that if you have time, but uh, avoid it if you can. A repeat of what we said, students must remember that they need to do more than just say that the opposite of an incorrect answer is true. You won't get a knockout mark for that if you're, if you're relying on knockout marks. And my strong advice to you, if there are diagrams and tables provided, it says you may annotate, you may complete the table, just cross out the word may and just put must, because uh, you'll be on a better pathway to a higher mark in this paper.
So I hope that uh, this little session might have just given you a bit of extra confidence. I'm sure you've already got good technique in answering these, these papers. The supported multiple choice paper is, is a challenge for students, but if you get the right technique and if your economics is solid, uh, you should be in a, in a good place to, uh, to get some high marks. So thank you for joining me on this particular revision webcast. Uh, we're hoping to do a few more. There's a load on the website already. If you go to our website, choose to your website and just type in revision webcast. There's quite a few to look at. Uh, thank you for joining me and uh, see you again sometime soon.